Take a Bible with me, if you will, and open it to the last book of the Bible. Back to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, where we will be reading together in just a few moments. We live in the midst of a confused culture. A confused culture wherein the most fundamental aspects of humanity are very frequently blurred and distorted. And so with the overall theme of victory in Jesus as really what we have set our minds on as a congregation throughout 2015, what we have been doing, especially in recent months off and on, is looking at how to find, number one, solid ground as disciples of Jesus in the midst of a very confused culture, and number two, how to live victoriously as individual disciples of Christ in our various walks throughout this darkened world as disciples of Jesus. And so we have talked about victorious masculinity and femininity. We went back to the very beginning. And we have tried to be very deliberate in recent months in going back and noticing what God has delivered. So very straightforward and simple. We've been trying to follow the lead of Jesus when he asked, for instance, in Matthew chapter 19, have you not read what he who created all things said in the very beginning. And so we have taken our cue and we have gone back to the very beginning. What does it mean to be male, number one, as defined by God? And how do we live victoriously in Jesus as men? Same thing for femininity. What did God say from the very beginning? We want to build our lives on that solid rock. And how can we live victorious lives as disciples of Jesus, those of us who are female. Several weeks ago we went back and we listened in, we studied intently from Genesis chapter 2. What will it mean, what does it look like to have a victorious marriage? Taking our cue from Jesus, have you not read what he who created in the beginning said? That is rock-solid, God-shaped ground on which to stand and which to build. We don't want to take anything for granted as disciples of Christ, especially in light of how many very young disciples we have, not only in their walk with Jesus, but also as far as age is concerned. This evening we take it a step further. And I have to tell you that this is a, a difficult step for me. It is a very challenging step for me. I was scheduled to deliver this sermon weeks ago, but because of a variety of different shifts that we made in the schedule, this has been sitting on my lap, staring me like a, a daunting topic for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. I, like so many of you, know what God says. I know the call. I know the challenge. I know the, the clear principles and the commands and the divine expectations. But I also know me. And I know how easily and frequently I fail to step up to the call. I want you to realize that as I talk about these things from God's word this evening, I am a sinner in desperate need of God's grace and grace of other people. And I trust that as we dig into this, there are many, many men in this audience who would stand right there in line with me. What does it mean, according to God, to be a victorious husband? 
you have your Bibles open there to Revelation chapter 19. We have been studying on Wednesday evenings here in the auditorium, our adult class, from Revelation chapter 19. We see this glorious glimpse of what is to come. Revelation 19 and verse 6, John says, I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord, our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb. What is, is being pictured here is a marriage. It is the marriage of the Lamb of God who gave Himself on a cross for your sins and for my sins. The announcement is made. The marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Our key text for this evening is Ephesians chapter 5. If you would turn in your Bibles back there to Ephesians chapter 5, where we find, you might place a marker there, we will be there throughout the evening. Ephesians chapter 5 establishes the fact that human marriage, marriage here on this earth, in this age, by God's design, is to be a portrait. Marriage on this earth is to be a portrait. It is to be a reflection. It is to serve as a momentary parable of the ultimate marriage that we just read about. In Revelation chapter 19. The ultimate marriage is the perfect unhindered union of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, with his bride. His church for which he gave himself. And now in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is going to use that. The Spirit of God leads Paul to use the ultimate marriage in order to talk about Human marriage. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22, he writes to wives. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, notice, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. As, notice, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That, that is what we are reading about in Revelation chapter 19. The Lamb of God has given himself willingly, deliberately shed his blood for his bride. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, husbands, love your wives. Jesus did this that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Notice once again, our attention drawn to the ultimate marriage, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. We are looking for rock solid, God-shaped ground on which to stand in the midst of a confused culture wherein the most fundamental aspects of humanity are frequently blurred and distorted. And so we take our cue from Jesus who asked in Matthew 19, Have you not read what he who created in the very beginning said? And what did he quote? The same thing that the Spirit of God leads Paul to quote in Ephesians 5. All the way back from Genesis chapter 2. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Here is the point made most clearly. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ. And the church. My marriage is to be a portrait. If you are married, your marriage is to be a reflection. If you are not married and hope to be married one day, this is what marriage is. This is what marriage is to be according to the architect, according to the designer, according to the perfect builder. Marriage is to be a portrait, a reflection, a momentary, in view of eternity, a momentary parable of the relationship of Christ to his church. And so, husbands, would you walk with me to the foot of the cross this evening, hearing the call, more about wives to come, hearing the call, husbands, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and come face to face with this incredible reality that most fundamentally the portrait of a victorious husband harmonizes with the portrait of Jesus. Imagine having a portrait of Jesus, not the, the, the portrait of Jesus wherein human beings guess uh, rather inaccurately, if we imagine what a first century Jew would have looked like, uh, nonetheless, human beings guess what Jesus might have looked like. We're not talking about that portrait. We're talking about the portrait that God paints in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and through the rest of the New Testament. You have the portrait of Jesus and take all of those words, those beautiful word pictures and envision that as a literal portrait. And then I look at me and you look at you. And you realize that according to the great designer of marriage, my portrait is to come into harmony with the portrait of Jesus. Your portrait that you have been painting today. And yesterday, and last week, and throughout 2015, and as long as you have been married, and even before you got married. The portrait that is you, the portrait that no one is painting other than you. No one can force any aspects of your portrait upon you. 
I choose what that portrait will look like based upon my character, based upon my mindset, based upon my priorities, based upon my actions. I am the one painting that portrait. You are the one painting the portrait of you. And walk with me to the foot of the cross and realize that the portrait of a victorious husband harmonizes with the portrait of Jesus. Victorious husbands are clear reflections of Jesus. Victorious husbands are active participants with their wives in this earthly parable of marriage, a parable pointing to the ultimate marriage of Christ. To his church. If you have your Bible open there to Ephesians 5, would you look with me a page or two before to Ephesians chapter 2? If you are thinking about what we have already established from Scripture, that the portrait of a victorious husband harmonizes with the portrait of Jesus, and victorious husbands are clear reflections of Jesus, and they are to be active participants with their wives in this incredible God-designed parable, then surely you realize that this is going to require amazing grace. It is the grace that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. You have your Bible open there where he says to Christians, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, men who are not. Clear reflections of the will of God. Men whose portraits do not harmonize with the portrait of Jesus Christ. Men who are willing, humbly, to admit in verse 3, among whom we all lived once in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires not of God but of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God. Being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. To be this man requires amazing grace. To be this man requires ongoing work you look at Ephesians 2 and verse 10 we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them to be the portrait of a victorious husband that harmonizes with the portrait of Christ that's going to require ongoing work it's going to require a solid foundation the foundation that we read of beginning in verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 2 where Paul says you are no longer strangers and aliens but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. There is no such thing as a victorious husband defined by God as victorious who does not build on this solid foundation, who is not an ongoing work in progress, who is not the recipient and swimming knowingly, deliberately, every day in the amazing grace of God. Being this man, according to Ephesians chapter 3, is going to require great inner strength. The sort of strength that does not come naturally. The sort of strength that you were not born with. The sort of strength that you can't pay any amount of money 
for or make some sort of a fleshly trade for. No, in Ephesians 3 and verse 14, Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Do you see that? The portrait of a victorious husband harmonizes with the portrait of Jesus Christ. What incredible inner strength that requires the sort of inner strength that Paul prayed that these Ephesians would have. That Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith. And that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength. This man requires that strength. Being this man requires life-giving strength. Roots. We continue reading in verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. That is what husbands are called to do, called to be in Ephesians chapter 5. It requires amazing grace, ongoing work, a solid foundation, inner strength, life-giving roots grounded in love. So that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Do you see? Victorious husbands are clear reflections of Christ. Victorious husbands are active participants with their wives in the earthly parable that is marriage a parable of the ultimate relationship of Christ to his church which leads us to Ephesians 4 and verse 1 where Paul says I therefore a prisoner for the Lord urge you. He has laid the solid foundation of God's amazing grace and the ongoing work of Christ in our lives and the solid foundation of the prophets and the apostles, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. He has revealed the opportunity for supernatural inner strength, the strength that God supplies via life-giving roots when Jesus dwells in your heart. Through faith. There is the foundation. Now in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. The call begins. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. To which you have been called. And he addresses all sorts of aspects of life. In Ephesians 4, 5 and 6. What we are most interested in for this evening. Is Ephesians 5. And this idea of victorious husbands. Number one, what do they do? Victorious husbands love their wives. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. As Christ loves the church. He has already spoken to wives. More on that, Lord willing, to come. But notice... Husbands, he does not immediately command you to be the head of your wife. He has told your wife to submit to your leadership, but he does not begin by saying, husbands, lead. Instead, he tells you to be filled with love for your wife. And he bids you to allow him to be the definer of that love. A love that does not harmonize with our culture. 
It is not the love that says, I will give as long as I get. It is not the love that says, I will love as long as you are lovable. It is not the artificially sweetened, highly choreographed, plastic, fake picture that Hollywood paints for us of love. It is a love that is an act of the will. Not purely physical, not based upon outward circumstances, not based upon human emotion and nothing more. It is love that is an act of the will. It requires action. You are told, I am told to act in love toward her based upon the perfect model of Jesus Christ. And his love for his people. How did he love his people? How much did he love his bride? Not simply with words. Not based on circumstances. Not dependent upon reciprocation. Not rooted in outward circumstances or inward feelings. It was an act of the will. He gave himself up for her. He gave his life. He was active. He was deliberate. And the Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Spirit of God, uses that and says, that is the ultimate relationship. Yours is to be a portrait that harmonizes. Yours is to be a clear reflection. You also are to be an active participant in this momentary parable wherein you display, I display my love for my wife when I willingly, joyfully give myself up. I am to lead in love. The same writer in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4 said, This love is patient. This love is kind. This love does not envy or boast. This love is not arrogant. This love is not rude. This love does not insist on its own way. This love is not irritable or resentful. This love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. This love rejoices with the truth. This love bears all things. This love believes all things. This love hopes all things. This love endures all things. This love never ends. You may remember several years ago, Pat Robertson, on a widely syndicated television show that he has hosted for years, made quite a stir when he got a question asking if it was all right for a man to leave his wife if she had Alzheimer's and could no longer recognize him or love him. And Pat Robertson said, yes. Do you see a portrait of Christ and the church in a man who stays with his wife despite Alzheimer's and who cares for her and genuinely loves her and gives himself up for her day by day, even though perhaps it has been years since she even recognized him. Is that an accurate, miniature portrait of the real marriage of Christ and the church? Absolutely it is. You want to be a victorious husband. Put your name in place of the word love in 1 Corinthians 13. By God's amazing grace, 
by his ongoing work in your life, built on the solid foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ, leaning on the strength that God and God alone can supply, drawing life and meaning and purpose from these life-giving roots of Jesus Christ, dwelling in your heart by faith. Grow to be able to say, Jason is patient and kind. I do not envy or boast. I am not arrogant or rude. I do not insist on my own way. I am not irritable or resentful. I do not rejoice at wrongdoing. I rejoice with the truth. I am willing to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. I am willing to stand and live by this love that never ends. Why? Because Jesus Christ loves me that way. Husbands are told to love their wives as Christ loved the church and lead by presenting themselves as living sacrifices. If anyone lives the Romans 12, 1 life in a home, it should begin with the husband. If anyone is going to model the Romans 12 verse 1 sort of mindset, it ought to be the husband. Love your wife as Christ loved the church and lead by presenting yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Victorious husbands live having brought their wills, their minds, their hearts into harmony with the portrait of Christ so that they say each and every day with Paul in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. Husbands, you want to wear a crown, wear the crown of thorns with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And if I am a husband now, he is calling me to love my wife as he loves the church and to lead by presenting myself as a sacrifice. How in the world do you do that? If we go back to our key text in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And the how harmonizes with what the ultimate lover and leader has already done. How do victorious husbands love and lead that way? By the word. With the word. Through the word. To borrow the language of 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 and 2. I would remind you, brothers, Paul says, of the gospel I preach to you. Which you receive, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Individually to begin. Personally, I humbly receive it. Humbly receive the word. Penitently seek cleansing by it. Grow in my knowledge of the grace that it expounds. Consistently Stand in the word so that I might lead in the light of the word. And so let me ask you. How are you doing in that area? Husband. Is the word. The centerpiece, the spiritual feast, the spiritual light around which 
everything in your home is built? Are you loving in accordance with the word? Are you leading by the word? What do we do with the word at home? Are we leading in prayer? Are we leading in gospel perspective? Are we leading by being willing to say what needs to be said in harmony with the gospel in those difficult moments? Jesus' relationship to us was all about the word, about bringing us into submission with his word. He saves us by the word. It is his word now that calls us to be holy. It is his word that challenges us each and every day to put off the old self and to put on the new self. And now our unique tasks as husbands, first of all, is to humbly receive it, penitently seek cleansing by it, consistently stand in it, so that we might lead, set the pace, challenge, remind, help with the word in the lives of our family. Finally, why? Because according to Ephesians chapter 5, victorious husbands lead their marriages as close as humanly possible to the ultimate marriage of Jesus and the church when they treat this earthly parable as prep time. This earthly parable in which I am called to actively participate, this earthly parable in which my portrait is to come into harmony with the portrait of Jesus, my reflection is to be a clear reflection of Jesus. Victorious husbands lead their marriages as close to the ultimate marriage as humanly possible when they treat this earthly parable of marriage as prep time. For presentation to Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.25. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Why? So that he might present the church to himself. In splendor. I don't care what you buy for your wife. I don't care the sort of home that you can acquire so that you and your wife can live there. I don't care what sort of perks you can attain. I don't care what sort of vacations you're able to take your wife on. Nothing will compare if by God's grace and his ongoing work and the solid foundation and inner strength and the life-giving roots, nothing will compare if both you and your wife on that great day when all are presented before Christ, if your wife is able to stand before her Creator Beautiful. Not because of her outward appearance, but because she is completely free of sin. Not because of what you were able to buy her, but because every shred of sin, every shred of imperfection is gone. The old self is put off entirely and now permanently and the new self is all that she is and she is completely holy, completely pure and clean. All that God had created her to be as beautiful as she is now, it is nothing compared to how beautiful the bride of Christ will be then. Husbands, Our great task is to love her in that way now and to lead her to that goal then. 
which means that we had better be very serious in our pursuit of holiness. He died, Jesus died, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Why? So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. You want to be a victorious husband. For the good of your own soul, for the sake of your wife, as a tangible expression of your love for her, for the glory of God, be an example of, be a leader in the pathway of holiness. That's what Jesus did for us. And so he says, in the same way, husbands should love their wives. As their own bodies. He who loves his wife. Loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh. But nourishes. And cherishes it. Just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore. A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. Your marriage is to be a work of art that is stewarded every day. You are not the Lord in your home. I am not the Lord in my home. Victorious marriages are works of art to be stewarded. To be held as divinely designed, divinely fashioned treasures. Victorious marriages are worked on like a masterpiece. So that they become beautiful. Accurate portraits. Of the ultimate marriage. Stunning living pictures of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This mystery is profound. And Paul says I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. More on that Lord willing to come. Could I encourage all of you, whomever you are, to be praying for the husbands that are represented in this room this week? I can assure you that I need it, and I am very confident that I'm not the only one. Husbands, men, let's walk in the light of the Lord. Let's act like men 